Hello everyone, my name is Ben and you're watching Uncharted X. The Giza Plateau is a very complicated place and you couldn't really hope to see every aspect of it even if you were to spend months here. And many people are compelled to just keep on coming back to Egypt and exploring year after year. This video is about one of the smaller, more out of the way underground constructions that is still part of the pyramid complex, but I think it's one that very few people get to see or appreciate fully. It offers some tantalizing clues to what must have been a very long history of ancient civilizations that once lived and worked here, as well as displaying some just astonishing properties of harmonic resonance. I have been using footage from this small site as part of a longer video that I'm working on on the topic of resonance specifically, but there's just so much good evidence of inheritance and reuse here that I wanted to share a quick dedicated look at some of these very interesting details, as it's often in these lesser well-known places that we are given a rare opportunity to learn and move our understanding of the history of this place forward. As is the case in many of my videos, we were joined by two of the best guides you could ever hope to hire in Egypt. Yusuf Aywan, an accomplished stonemason, musician, and chematologist. He's the son of the late and renowned indigenous wisdom keeper Hakim El Aywan. On this trip, we also had Mohammed Ibrahim with us. He is an academically trained Egyptologist. He's off running his own tour company now, but they are both excellent teachers. They're both fluent in hieroglyphs, and they have both spent a lifetime studying the endless details of ancient Egypt and other megalithic cultures. So I hope you enjoy this look into just one of the many mysteries to be found on the Giza Plateau. There is a little bit of audio interference just in the first few seconds of this recording. I've done my best to minimize it, but otherwise I would highly recommend using a good set of headphones in order to fully experience the range of the just incredible acoustics I've recorded in this subterranean chamber. It's just one of many bedrock excavations that are all clustered in around the pyramids, and it was most definitely used as a tomb by the dynastic Egyptian civilization. The question remains though, were they the ones who originally built this place? Both together, not this or that. Both together. Spiritual power and intellectual ability. Which is something, before I even read this translation, I feel I got every time I went into the Great Pyramid, I met with extra spiritual power and intellectual ability. Yeah. And this is the meaning of it. I think it's just built a town around a city yeah. as it is written there huh. and the uh, the name of that pyramid Mendefer the one on the top that is the reason that they call it Memphis later yeah right it comes from yeah, yes, Memphis, that's what Memphis, from Memphis, Memphis then transferred to Memphis so they didn't build the pyramid then they came here and they settled in that location and then they built the like most city. Now everything from scratch that they built also more on a much older structure. And it happens that this word right here, Khen Tish, with that sign of a foreign land, means, this is one word from four symbols here. Mm. And it means settler. That's what this word means. Settlers. Yes. Yeah, not builders, but settlers. Not settlers. Yeah. Yes. And there used to be priesthood responsible for the settlers who was coming northerly from the south and settled in the uh, new mirror for the pyramid city. The other thing which we can believe that this chamber could exist in all the era and then reused as tomb later from a, a stone carver point of view. Yeah. The statues They're in all yeah. carved That's deep. relief. Yes, yeah. yes. And that's something can be added later. Yeah. But if you are working in one like your community and you are going to prepare statues, then you would usually leave these relief. It's also less in the work on carving of the 
gym, if we're going to work, if we're going to think normally. Right. Yeah. yeah. This is more work. Yeah. And the fact that between the middle pyramid and the third pyramid, there are plenty of chambers with no decorations, just the chamber and, and the shelves. Flat wall. Yeah. yeah. So repurposed as a tomb, this was later, you think? Mm -hmm. Was this ever repurposed as a tomb? It, it's it definitely known as a tomb. What we are saying, what are what we saying that it's possible that it was not a tomb before, yeah. before. it was something like the Ozerian shaft, which also officially they believe it's a symbolic tomb. But let's not go to the official explanation because there is no evidence to prove this. But the fact is, they are underground tunnels and wells and chambers that is connected to the middle pyramid structure, not separate from. So if this, if based on that example and others, we can take these that many of these chambers, rock cut chambers underground, are originally part of the pyramid complex, not separated from it, but reused later as burials. It's a possibility in my opinion. Yeah. It's quite evident to me that these statues have been carved by hand. You can clearly see that the walls were once flat and they've been added later on by carving into the flat walls themselves. And I think this is a good evidence of reuse and renovation because there are many such chambers around the Giza Plateau that do not have statues and adornments, it's just flat walls. Also, the name of this tomb itself is the tomb of the overseer of the builders of the pyramid city, not the builders of the pyramid. These were settlers that came along and most likely used the site and built on top of what they found here. Here, for example, this is the room. <laughs> this is one of the best residents in Jamaica. But uh, you can see that the wooden cluster is unfinished. Hmm? If we look here, for example, this cut here is not being tilled, which means it's unfinished. So, what is the difference between the challenge of, rocking, uh, of cutting a rock cut chamber and finishing a plaster work? Of course, the plaster work is much easier yeah. than cutting the chamber. So, if you reach it, all this limit, how come we can call it unfinished? It's not That's a very small room to resonate this much. That's crazy. Unless it's designed for some reason. The sound that you're hearing is something called a standing wave. Essentially, this chamber and its shapes, including the false door, are exactly the right dimensions to just perfectly reflect a particular wavelength or frequency of sound wave. In this case, we are humming the note, and you can clearly tell when we get it just right. The reflected sound wave reinforces itself. It gains power almost like a feedback loop. And it's quite an experience to be in the room and to do this. When the standing wave effect happens, you kind of lose all directionality for the sound. It seems like it's coming from everywhere. And you can feel your chest cavity just vibrate like a heavy bass line at a concert. It's frankly amazing. It's, I think you can see on my face. This effect seems to be a deliberate choice in many megalithic structures, and it's something that I'll take a deeper dive into in a dedicated resonance video. But as a quick teaser for that, here is something that I recorded from inside the Great Pyramid. You see that sound vibration? This is what's labeled as resonance valve by uh, Dr. Uh, Christopher Van. Cannot be just a coincidence. <laughs> and this is a, is a hotel. Hot yeah, this is a hotel. It's supposed to be an offering table. And this is a false door. And the false door is a dimensional. 
but we believe it has also a function or activation with sound. Yeah. And um, that's possible if there was a lot of, I mean, this is a common thing. Corrie with the water running underneath right there. That was the yeah. Maybe that this was then generating yeah. a tone from tipa. the yeah. And the tipa. Yeah, tipa. But here, the, the well is behind this from outside. Yeah. So this is not the, the only level. There is another level that's connected to this in a lower level. So lots of these levels is filled with water. Yeah. Is it originally made for water, or this water flooded in later? We cannot be positive. But feels like some of it is built originally to have water, and it also no doubt that lots of rock cut chambers were made during the dynastic when the priest who was responsible about mummification and burials had a, a good business going on. So they, they started to make more. Town. How can we tell the difference? For example, Hotips, we have this one that looks handmade. But we do have other ones that are that, that reflecting the ancient lost technology, like the tubular drains and the circular so on. Yeah, like Abu, uh, Abu Jamal. Abu Jamal. Some interesting links to other megalithic sites around the world that also use water as part of their construction, or at least it seems to be a common element that is either nearby, under, or around many megalithic structures. We mentioned the Coricancha in Peru, which is just a gigantic megalithic structure in the center of Cusco. It's an incredibly profound place, and there is an underground river flowing underneath the structure itself. Also, another site in Peru we mentioned called Tipon, which is constructed around the idea of flowing water. Water still flows through this site today. It's just a beautiful spot in the highlands of Peru. One other element that Yusuf pointed out is the Hotep that's been sort of crudely carved into the ledge in the chamber here. As he said, there are many other examples of just excellent hoteps that are fully carved, uh, notably the one at Abu Jarab, which is a site that I definitely will get into in some detail at some point, but there is a giant hotep carved directly out of quartzite. Uh, it's a very difficult material to work correctly, and this hotep has just signs all over it of advanced machining techniques. Things like tubular drill holes, in the corners, as well as a really strong circular saw mark that's in the center round piece of the hotep. So I'll leave up a little bit more footage of this hotep at Abu Jarab while you listen to some of the recordings that we made in the subterranean chamber when our video cameras were turned off. We were just doing a little bit of toning and discussing some other aspects of the site and the video will pick back up in a second. What is the moment? Mm. Just a quick note to address something that comes up fairly frequently in my comment sections, and that is that this place, and at least these chambers, were clearly not built by giants just going by the doorway size. 
you might be able to tell from some of my videos that I'm a fairly large sized human being, but I'm certainly no giant and I still have to duck lest I bless the place by slamming my forehead into it. Now this is a practice that my good friend Luke, who was behind the camera on this day, he likes to follow. He's been making a right tradition out of accidentally slamming his dome into megalithic doorways and tunnels. He's done it on at least three continents and it happens again right here. He damn near gave himself a concussion at Chavan Temple in Peru, and then there was this one time at Koh Kur in Cambodia. I might be an old metalhead at this point, but Luke is certainly the one that does all of the headbanging when it comes to travel. So I'm going to wrap this video up with a look at another subterranean chamber with some more false doors in it. The whole topic of false doors is a very interesting one and I will get into that in some depth in a future video on resonance. But once again, you'll see here as Yusuf points out, it's pretty clear that the false doors were probably functional originally. They were probably part of the original chamber's structure and they have later been repurposed and reused by the dynastic Egyptians. They even tried to imitate some of the precision granite work which is to me always a little bit confusing because apparently the Old Kingdom Egyptians were perfectly capable of doing pretty much anything they wanted in granite. Why do you have to imitate granite in this case? This is interesting and in my opinion it's a proof to tell us that also statues will come with you. Because this is the same false door. Yes. Like the one in the other chambers. Hmm? Here we find that the false door was used to continue. These lines used to continue just like the other one. And in this case, the statue was carved in here, which shows that the statue came over, so the, the false doors is, has to be older than carving these statues. So maybe this design is genuine with the chain, and the, not the statues and the rest of the decoration. But it's certainly possible that it, it's older than the statue. Yeah, that's what you're saying, right? That's a yes, possibility. Because, because it's why, 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 where is the rest? Yep. Here this shows that the false door reach it all the way down here. And they had all it had all these lines in it. Exactly. Like vertical lines. Exactly. And they carved they carved all this out probably. It's, it's easy to add writings and I want to tell you something else. When you look at these red dots, the darker red dots here, mm -hmm. this is nothing but imitating granite. Imitating granite. Yes. Yeah. That's what they like to do. To put the dots and sometimes they also add black into it to look like it granite. granite. And if you find the green in the inside here, that will probably be because there used to be copper housed in the inside of these glyphs at once. These so-called tombs are dated by their writing and they're attributed to the same Old Kingdom Egyptians, the 5th and 6th dynasty that built the rest of the Giza Plateau. I find it quite odd that these same people had to imitate granite because when you take a look at the other structures they're throwing around 70 tonne bricks of granite like it's nothing and they have all sorts of precision carved granite surfaces. It's just another contradiction in the story of history to me. So I hope you enjoyed that. I want to say a huge thank you to Matt over at the Ancient Architects channel. I'm sure most of you know about his channel, but if you, for some reason, don't, please go over and check it out. He sets the standard for high quality, concise history videos, and he gave my channel a shout out recently. So thanks, Matt. Please remember to give the video a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, and please do consider supporting the channel. You can find out all the ways to do that at unchartedx.com support. I will see you all in the next video.